Um, I'll just take you through. We've actually had a really interesting day, and I, I thank the organisers for um, everything they've done to put this together. I think the, the discussion on markets has been particularly useful for me, uh, looking at other markets, and there's a lot of similarities in particular with, with some of these metals uh, that are being involved in this space. So um, we'll spend a little bit of time. I've, I've covered, tried to cover as much as I could um, in, in these few minutes, um, given that we have to get to beer time really early, thanks to our next speaker, which is really good. So that makes me the last speaker, and drinking time starts immediately. So um, I need a point of view. Is there one over there? Okay, so we're really going to spend most of the time talking a bit about vanadium and then a little bit, um, if you like, the context of vanadium in respect to this particular project. You've all read that. Um, AVL really is developing, um, focused on developing uh, its Cabinetha project in the Midwest. Um, it's, the project is located just south of Mikathera, and I call that the vanadium triangle, uh, and I'll give you some reasons behind why that should be the case. Um, we've already put a lot of work into the um, measured, indicated, and, and uh, inferred resources on the, on the project over the last uh, sort of six or seven years. Company's already put a lot of work into it, but um, only the last four or five since I've been there have we um, pushed it into the next level and focused quite keenly on the vanadium. Um, you must remember that vanadium is really a steel market play. Um, the vanadium use in battery metals, which is why we're here, is very much a developing opportunity, but because of the way that vanadium is used in energy storage at the moment, that makes a very significant volume effect uh, down the track and uh, something that we need to pay attention to. Um, the, um, the focus on energy storage is something that we quite, uh, we're trying to focus on within the company because we believe that that market has to exist. Uh, unlike the lithium and other battery markets, you can go into that space and the space already exists for you. So you're really starting to look at how am I going to grow that space? And we decided to make, make a conscious effort to uh, create a subsidiary uh, which was focusing on the development of that market internally inside Australia because we believe that as a renewable uh, opportunity country, uh, we should be pushing that. And energy is about, vanadium, vanadium battery storage is about energy saving and energy transfer from renewables. There's a, there's a very strong reason why we wanted to get involved with the entire value chain. Um, that's the strategy in a nutshell. We really want to be focused on the development of the resource so we can feed the steel market and um, the flow through to the metal market. Um, the corporate snapshot I won't bore you with, but there's one important thing on that slide, and that's the guy at the bottom on the left. Uh, Daniel Harris um, is a very experienced um, international uh, vanadium executive. He's worked for all the major players globally. We're very lucky to have him on our board. Um, he came um, off Atlas's... Uh, he was acting at Atlas Iron as MD, when he came off that role and is now non-executive at Atlas Iron, he's come to join us uh, because he loves vanadium, deep down in his boots, and he's been all over the world with it, and having a guy like that in the team um, is essential for us and, and a great help to me. So let's just have a look at these markets for a minute. Um, where do we use vanadium primarily? That big part of that pie says 92% in steel, which is exactly where it goes. Um, the specific use of vanadium in steel um, is as an alloy, particularly in rebar, which is a primary driver for vanadium consumption. We have titanium alloys um, used, which use more vanadium on the way through. And then there's the chemical industry, which is very, very small. And we put vanadium energy storage, particularly you know, vanadium in, in, in vanadium redox flow batteries, into that category. Where does the vanadium come from? It comes from slag steel producers in China, 60% and a very small amount from mines, uh, new mines. And um, there'd be a mine, there's a mine in, in, in Brazil, there's one in, or two in South Africa, and uh, there used to be one here, and there's a couple in Russia. So there's not a lot of new mine material coming in. There are stone coal mines in China. Uh, they are high-cost producers. Um, global pricing is not a very big market, and, and interestingly, these, these metals that are getting involved in these things are all of a similar size. And, there's a commonality about how many tons of these things are used. So it's not a very big market overall. Um, and But importantly, the price of the product has doubled in the last six months. And there's been a reason for this. And once again, I looked at the curve that came up in one of our earlier presentations, um, and that looks very similar curve, <laughs> especially even at the end. So what you have is a long period. It was a spike early on, about the same time in 05. And then you've had a long, effectively a long period of degradation of that price. 
and in that, um, we had the global financial crisis, we had um, the end of the mining boom, and as um, iron ore requirements and steel requirements dropped in China, you saw a slow degradation of that um, around the world. And the primary producer of vanadium at the time was South Africa, uh, from ores out of the Bushveld complex. Those Bushveld, uh, those South African producers effectively went bust about three or four years ago, and that production has been taken out of the system forever. There's going to be a very, very long time before capital makes its way back to South Africa for a number of reasons. Uh, the political um, opportunities there for investment being not very exciting. Um, so there's what we've had is the structural breakdown, if you like, in, in vanadium production. At the end, but at the end of 15, you started to see that price move, primarily, again, because of steel reasons. So as we stand today, there's a, there's a gap in the market of about 8,000 tonnes of V, and uh, that's... Ironically, but the right same size as we'd like to be producing from Gabinete at some point in the near future. So there is a gap. We suspect that gap will only get bigger. Um, that is a global gap. Um, internally in China, there's a different breakdown. But importantly, um, because of the structural situation in the steel market, you'll see that gap widening. As vanadium gains traction in energy storage, particularly in China as well, um, you'll start to see that gap either widening or it provides opportunities for some companies like ourselves to fill it. So why do, we think, why do we think the project is significant? Well, we've located in an area that actually has, um, probably not, not anyone's actually put it out there, but within those that uh, vanadium triangle, we actually have over 500 million tonnes of 2012 resources that are probably sitting at a grade of over half a percent V205 in a number of deposits. Two up on Gab two of those are on Gabinantha. Um, we've got one at Barambi and we've got um, a deposit at, at Windermurra. Now, we can't negate the deposit at Windermurra, even though it had a, has a checkered history. There is a lot of sun capital at Windermurra that is still relevant to this exercise. Um, Barambi, moving ahead, there's uh, someone from Neo Metals here today, and uh, they're putting a lot of effort into their deposit. Um, it is a high titanium deposit. And then we have Gabinantha itself, which um, is quite unique in its geometry and geology in terms of the amount of vanadium it has in one particular high-grade horizon. Um, it's on the sandstone road just south of Mika, um, and so therefore infrastructure, it's not totally stranded, it's um, very close to the road, uh, it's easy country to work in, um, and it has close access to infrastructure within the Mika Thera area. Uh, we have done a lot of work on those little red dots there, our detailed drilling, which we focus in on that top section. Um, the resource extends down towards the south, uh, with most of the work done in the northern area, uh, where our indicated and measured resources are located. How do we stand as a global player? Um, there are a number of projects being developed around the world. Um, Vemedco and Makapani belong to Bushveld Minerals. Vemedco is in production. Makapani is a, a resource that's uh, quite large but not yet developed. Uh, the uh, Ligo Resources projects um, are in production and are world class in terms of their mag con grade in particular. Their resource grade is uh, relatively comparable to what we see at, at Gabinantha. However, the concentrate grade of magnetite is up around 3% and therefore puts it in a unique position globally. Uh, all the offtake from that is currently taken care of by Glencore. Um, so that's not really not taking part in Glen I mean, um, LIGO is not really taking part in the current market surge to its liking. Uh, further down, we have um, the other half of the Gabinantha deposit, or it's actually not half, slightly less, and then uh, Barambi. But if you look at Windermurra, Barambi, and the two Gabinantha deposits in that line, um, I've separated Gab uh, AVL's um, high-grade and low-grade deposits there. Um, but you're looking at a significant volume of tonnage just in that little uh, vanadium triangle. So it's a place to watch. Um, when you start to get below half a percent, you have to start thinking about other things because you have to try and recover the other metals in your deposit. You can't rely solely on vanadium every time. Um, the process of extracting vanadium starts to become expensive because of your stripping ratio, how much ore you've got to put through the mill to get a, a, the yield out. And when you're starting to push down to like below half a percent of ETO5, you've got to be looking for some other credits in there. So, um, Gabinantha is um, one of a number of structurally dismembered um, layered mafic intrusions in the Yilgon uh, called the Lady Alma complex. Um, the, um, actually, I'll pop on the next map. I'm just going to go back there. 
Sorry, I'll stay there. Um, there are a number of features within these um, these bodies which indicate like a, a chemical fractionation and pulses of magma, including in there um, coming into the chambers that have changed the nature of the uh, of the um, of the layering and moving in between magnetite stability and out of it. And in these, um, they're very typical of uh, and very comparable to the main zone rocks of the Bushfell complex, where you had iron enrichment and uh, you've now had precipitation of magnetite, either in specific layers uh, that are massive magnetite or in uh, magnetite gabbros. So the rock types are pretty simple in terms of identifying them, except for their weathered cousins, which are a little bit harder to identify at, at times. But you can find your way through the massive magnetite, obviously, that thing on the right, you can see from that image, those grains are about a centimetre. So you've got really good grain size in there. Uh, the massive magnetite um, or the massive magnetite banding. Then you have uh, the magnetite gabbros, which are more a disseminated uh, form of magnetite within the gabbros themselves. Then you have plain gabbros and grading up, up right through leucogabbers into anorthosites. The anorthosites are really often highly weathered, but they form good markers. And the good thing about this layered complex is that it does behave like one very well. Um, it's, it, it enables you to find your way through it, not only from a gray, but also from a logging point of view. Um, and feel very, feel very comfortable in identifying the lithology you're working in. Um, the weathering profile is complex, um, particularly at, at Gantha, because we have effectively two different, very different ore bodies sitting on top of each other. We have a, um, a, a magnetite gabbro sequence um, coming in and out of magnetite stability. Um, and then you've got, um, in, in a banded sort of way, and then you've got a massive magnetite, which is very hard and solid, sitting at the base of that throughout. Um, the uh, mineralisation, we did some work, um, some really good work with the Centre for Exploration Targeting about two years ago, uh, which was really definitive for us. And uh, we're going to be going, I go back to that report often. I couldn't stress more that people do good mineralogy all the time from the very beginning, that the moment they've got core um, to start looking at it and spend the time with, with, with good people and good analysis right down to the sub-grain size level to characterise your ore. I think um, uh, we had a talk earlier this morning um, about that. It's really essential and it helps you so much when you're having that chat with a Met about what you know geologically and how that domaining goes. Um, the, um, the sequence at Gabinet is underlined by this massive magnetite layer and the, the thing that's really got me interested in it. I did some. I did a very bad honours project at, in the Bushfell complex for my honours degree. Sorry for those who have to judge me on my honours degree. But uh, we, um, uh, the, I did some work on the UG2 with uh, Grant Cawthorn from Vitz. And um, in my poor learning that was my honours project and through my final year, we did a lot of work on, on, on the layered bodies of the Bushfell. And it's a great place to learn about those things. I'm going back to some papers by Cawthorn, which I've referenced at the back of this uh, paper. Um, they talk about the the pulsing of um, new material into the magma chamber, changing the oxygen fugacity, and how that was some key f a key feature to the precipitation of of these high grade TIV magnetites um, oxides. And it is a the, if you look at the reference of these papers um, later on, um, it is it is worth a read, and it is. Um, uh, amazingly similar to the bushfire complex rocks as well. Um, the slow cooling um, again has positives and negatives. Uh, we have very in, we have very coarse grain sizes. This is turns out this is very helpful in the in the beneficiation step because our grain sizes are very coarse, up sort of up centimeter scale. That means we're starting to get liberation at sort of half uh, five hundred microns to, and 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 very good liberations at that size, which means we don't have to work so hard to get the material out, uh, and that's a great win. Um, because of the um, the way the, the main high grade horizon is sealed, effectively because of its thickness, we see uh, different weathering profiles on the edges and on the inside, and that means we're protecting the magnetite from its, its weathering to myotite, and that that itself as well is la allowing us to use uh, magnetic methods to extract the material. So we've also got a couple of other uh, things we found from our microscope uh, microscopy work. And the mineralogy work, uh, the SEM work identified that the V in magnetite is extremely high compared to the material around it. That's uh, where the partitionings happen between the magnetite and the rutile and ilmenite. You're always going to get some of that going in. Um, so you're going to, when you're trying to beneficiate that, you're going to lose some of your V into the into the rutile and ilmenite. You don't want that to happen too strongly, otherwise you've got nothing left to take out. So, but what we found is we've got uh, very high V in magnetite. And uh, if we can get 
crack that code. Um, depending on the grain size that we can liberate it at, we should be able to get some of that out into a high-grade con. It does mean we change our back-end process a lot, but we're working with some good guys who know their stuff, and uh, having Harris on board is, is particularly useful in trying to crack this, uh, crack this one open and uh, make ourselves uh, quite unique globally. Because of the high magnetite layer, sorry, the, high, the, the thickness of the, um, of the main high-grade layer, we have uh, an opportunity to get a very high yield. Um, in terms of the exploration, um, I don't want to say it's done and dusted, but uh, that, magnet, that magnetic signature tells you a little bit about it. That's a, um, a view looking uh, just east of north. Um, and you can see the signal uh, that we have and the data we have was very instructive on helping us uh, correlate and correlate our drilling. The, the most the bulk of the drilling up on that left-hand side is where the measured and indicated resources are. The deposit is very consistent all the way to the south uh, where it starts to break up and, and lose a bit of coherence in the upper zones is uh, in the south where you get a bit more faulting. On section, there's two sections here. You've got that purple zone which is running well over a percent and is very consistent. Uh, the dip looks quite steep on that section but it had to flatten off a little bit to around the sort of 50, 45, 50 mark. Um, the hanging wall as you can see is made up of a series of modelable bands that are both coherent in geology and in, uh, in grade and, and very clear bands of, of no grade, if you like, so material that's sort of sub 0.3%. Um, interestingly, our hanging wall is about overall about 0.5. It's about half of our deposit and uh, it runs um, uh, probably what everyone else's waste is. I mean, or is, should I say. Another section, uh, you can see the consistency along strike and down dip. Uh, we've just finished a model using Leapfrog Geo, which was a fantastic exercise for this particular deposit, uh, and it allowed us to model those fault blocks very accurately up to nine horizons. We took the data out and moved it over to uh, SERPAC for great estimation. And we're very, very, very comfortable with the result, and it allows us to have a very defined model going into pit optimization and mine planning. Okay, cool. Um, 179 million tonnes at 0.75, and that high grade is 92.8 million tonnes at 0.96 per cent. I'll skip the, the met work, even though I'll just go to this slide, which is the next one. Which, uh, I was, uh, we've identified some key parameters, but on the bottom right, I think this is the most important parameter of all, is that uh, the people part of the equation is essential. So let's just cover it off with the uh, idea about energy storage. What are we doing here? Um, we often get asked this question, so I'll put it in the presentation. How much vanadium do you use to, to power a vanadium redox flow battery? And what does it do with it, that material? So um, we have, um, when you take, uh, use 145 grams of vanadium pentoxide at a high purity level, it goes into per litre, and you end up using 9.8 tonnes of vanadium pentoxide to store one megawatt hour of energy. Now, the thing with vanadium in energy storage is about storing energy, not power. So the vanadium flow battery is derived about a power, an energy storage battery. It doesn't have a very high um, energy density in that form, and it doesn't deliver a big push amount like you'd get from a lithium battery. So there's a different application for vanadium storage. It is a very fast reaction um, down to the 20 to 30 millisecond level, so it can do a lot of work, but it uses some unique characteristics of vanadium in order to achieve this. In particular, it's a single element in solution. It uses the fact that vanadium can stay in oxidation, so stay in solution in four separate oxidation states. And that in itself is what makes the vanadium flow battery very, very interesting. Because when you don't have, you don't have the issue of cross-contamination, and you don't therefore have, you have an in, indefinite chemical lifetime in terms of the reversible reaction itself. So you're not degrading that battery at all over its entire life. It means you can work it really hard. You can, you can cycle that battery twice a day if you wanted to. Um, it's thermally a comfortable reaction. It's operating between zero and 50, 60 degrees quite comfortably. So in the, in the, in the world that we live in, that's a reaction you don't have to spend a lot of time cooling and worrying about overheating. There's no possibility of overheating the system at all. Um, there are no other metals involved um, except the vanadium that you've got in solution. And the cell structure, which was in a, an invention um, 
uh, an Australian invention, uh, is achieving that. Um, obviously, on the downside, you have uh, alternatives to, of higher battery level. Um, this is all on the ARG website, and it'll be recorded, so I'll skip through some of this, but there is some, some chemistry there for you. That reaction gives you a 1.26 volt um, cell, which doesn't sound like very much compared to that 3 volt cell you get out of lithium ion. But what you've got there is a consistent, well-behaved cell that's in a re recyclable form, if you like, where that, that energy is not being... Um, you, you're getting good energy use for, for bang for your buck, you might say. We've installed one of these in Busselton. Um, it's been operating for over a year. That's what a commercial flow battery looks like. It's 100 kilowatt hours, 10 kilowatts powered by the solar there. That particular site hasn't used the grid since it was installed. It hasn't been switched off. It just runs every day like a very, very long-lived long -lived pool pump. Um, it's very quiet, and it's a very simple thing to have in place. So it's all about energy, um, not about power all the time. And when it comes to renewables, this is the key argument in favour of vanadium redox flow battery technology, is that when we want to guide higher levels of renewable in society, we have to capture energy, uh, whether it's wind or solar. Energy we can't dispatch at the time we need it, we want to shift it, we need large stores, and large stores can be created through through these. Um, I'll skip that slide, but that's basically a slide showing capacity degradation over time, an inherent issue with all other forms of storage that are lithium-based, uh, but VRB gives you a different view. Uh, again, there's a comparison in there, and you're talking about cycle life. Uh, we think the Australian market is very ripe for this. Uh, policy aside, um, the, the implementation is, again, people-driven, the more people want to implement renewable solutions, they will. So therefore, finding um, a way of shifting or capturing that energy and applying it back um, is, is, is going to be part of the landscape. And we think that as an Australian invention, it should find its way. As a company, um, it makes sense for us to focus on this side of the market and developing this new market for energy storage for vanadium because it, it does start to change the landscape of the vanadium pricing scenario, how much vanadium is used in the world. And from that re previous slide, you can see the growth that is there if we can add this in. So we're very interested in playing, if you like, both sides of this coin, the steel coin, which will continue to be relevant, and to continue to play the vanadium battery side because we think it's a worthwhile um, application of our metal and application for society. So that's it for now. Thank you.